Prince William Sound, Alaska. A magnificent maritime environment, unspoiled by pollution or defiled by development. Prince William Sound, pristine until... From the sound of it, Captain Joseph Hazelwood couldn't have known that he was reporting what was about to become the largest oil spill in American history, and for Prince William Sound, a catastrophe. For many of the region's inhabitants, it was over comparatively quickly. Tens of thousands of animals were dead within days. No human lives were lost, but millions of man hours and billions of dollars were in the effort to clean up the mess, which continues today. Is this acceptable anywhere? Biologist Tim Langdon of the Alaskan Department of Environmental Conservation shows us that 15 months after the spill, pools of oil can still be found on the shores of the Sound. This area here is re-oiled over the course of the winter after treatment. In other areas, the oil hides beneath the surface, and Langdon fears it will come back to haunt the region in years to come. Uh, even though it's locked up right now, we may have a violent storm event, say in five years, and liberate that oil. Uh, who's going to be here to, to protect and collect that oil? I mean, we're talking hundreds of barrels. I can tell you one thing, if we ever have a major tanker accident in Tampa Bay, that's what the salt marshes around the entire bay are going to look like. There's no question about that. This is similar to uh, our environment? Very similar, and of course the mangroves are going to be impacted too, and they're not going to be any better off. It's going to be happening. It, it happens in Louisiana and Texas. You guys are next. So what are you going to do about it? And you can't do it later. Uh, you have to do it now. The Port of Valdez, Prince William Sound. The oil industry organization that administers safety here calls itself Alieska, an Eskimo word meaning great spirit. But despite its name, the consortium didn't come close to producing a miracle when the Exxon Valdez disgorged itself on Bly Reef. In fact, according to virtually anyone you speak with, it failed miserably in responding to the spill. Because in this case, even though there was a plan in place, uh, the companies responsible to carry out the plan didn't implement that plan. There just wasn't the political support uh, outside the areas that were really affected to, to get the job done. We did not have uh, equipment located nearby to handle it. And because of the location where it occurred in a remote area, it was very difficult to get the equipment here to respond properly. To that end, extraordinary safety measures have been adopted, including two ship's emergency response vessels loaded with towing and containment gear to escort each laden tanker out of the sound. In addition to the escort vessels, containment gear and personnel are deployed around the sound to respond to a spill like firefighters. Also, the entire region is blanketed by Coast Guard radar, which can track and control ship movements. And by the way, we've enhanced the radar capability of our radar. So on Prince William Sound, there has been a tremendous increase in precaution since all that oil was lost. But on Tampa Bay, what has been done since all the lives were lost? In the past decade, two major maritime disasters have resulted in virtually no tangible changes in the way we operate ships on the bay. The only improvements that I am fully aware of is a better fendering system on the Skyway, which prevents vessels from hitting it due to any circumstances, whether it be storm circumstances or loss of power, loss of rudder, error in uh, command. That doesn't protect the ship, however, that's hitting the bridge, and it doesn't protect ships from colliding into one another as the, the Blackthorn did on the bay, does it? It absolutely does not. So today, Tampa Bay pilots continue to guide ships into the bay and the 21st century with old technology. And another concern is the age of the ships and the quality of the crews. 
that are more and more showing up on the foreign flag vessels from third world countries that don't have the same standards of watch standing or training or licensing of these individuals. You may have as many as 10 different languages spoken on one ship where communications could be vital to safety and there's a breakdown in communications. Also the manpower. The number of people continually gets to be eroded to where not only is the crew undermined and overworked, but also the condition of the vessel in general between dry dock periods is not maintained properly. So these things add to the chances of a breakdown in the engine room, a steering failure, a miscommunication in the crew, all of which adds to the complications and takes away from the safety on those waters. Alaska. An Arctic realm crowned with snow and ice. Certainly it's the antithesis of our subtropical paradise. But there are similarities particularly along the shores that surround Prince William Sound. The tidal marshlands here serve the same function as they do in the Bay Area. They're a highly complex ecosystem providing essential habitat and feeding areas for coastal wildlife. And they also act as a giant filter cleaning the waters of the Bay. Be they here or in Florida, the marshlands are the sections of the shoreline most vulnerable to a spill and most difficult for man to deal with. Trying to get the oil out of a salt marsh and out of mud flats is extremely difficult because not only does it damage the vegetation to physically remove the oil, but just the act of walking around in an environment like that forces the oil down into the mud, which even makes it more difficult to get out. So any oil spill around the salt marsh, the mud flats, or the mangroves, which are so prevalent, will be a very difficult thing to try to correct and clean up. Should a spill occur, then a rapid response is essential. But on Tampa Bay, there is very little time. We do figure that the bay would be covered within two to three hours, yes. It would be very difficult to uh, stop, and it would most likely be an after-the-fact cleanup. A grim assessment, though accurate. But is it acceptable in light of lessons learned in Alaska? First is to take all the steps we can to prevent tanker accidents. Second is to make sure that the that the preparation for spill response, the planning is in place. And third, make sure that the plans are actually implemented. In the Bay Area, planning is not in place. Not only can we not respond rapidly enough to contain a major spill, but the response and subsequent cleanup effort is likely to be fraught with controversy as divergent interests argue about their respective environmental and economic priorities. We don't have but maybe two hours to react to a catastrophic spill event at the Skyway. We don't have time to make these decisions then. We need to sit down and make them ahead of time. And as frustrating as it is to get all those people together, I see that as the role of the Regional Planning Council. Have any of those decisions been made to your satisfaction as it is now ahead of time? No. When the Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound, the first reaction was virtual inaction. No one involved, not even the captain, had any conception of the enormity of the impending catastrophe. We get some oil, and uh, we're going to be here for a while. But had everyone immediately and simultaneously understood the magnitude and urgency of the event, right about there is where the Exxon Valdez went aground. There was still nothing they could do. Not a single person or piece of equipment was poised for deployment. It was the Pearl Harbor of Prince William Sound. We knew we had a ship uh, go aground, but the quantity of oil that was coming out was beyond our comprehension, I think. There was sheening uh, that was not contained, and I'm, I'm wondering where quality control fits into that, that scenario. Never again will the Alaskans yeah, underestimate the potential for disaster. We will do the very best job we can. Nor are they likely to be caught unprepared. Sixteen months after the fact, meetings on the matter are still packed. Concern is not hard to come by here. These people are veterans of an ecological cataclysm. These are real problems that do occur, and I think this bill goes a long way, as I said, as a preventive measure, and when it happens, that we have the resources to take an action. Today, Florida is far behind Alaska in preparing for the potential environmental Armageddon, but at least the declaration of war has been signed. Legislation increasing enforcement, funds, and equipment to protect our waters. Among those on hand at the ceremony, Tampa Bay pilot Gary Maddox. Regretfully, it was a disaster that focused the attention on doing what we should have been doing all along. But uh, with this thrust and with the leadership we have now, it seems to be going in a great direction. I hope it stays that way. It's a step in the right direction, but crucial federal legislation remains in limbo. 
And meanwhile, at least three tankers a day have courses set for Tampa Bay. Unless this country, the people of the United States, commit themselves, commit themselves, make a firm commitment to protecting the environment as best they can, then all this is for naught. We will not have learned anything. Sixteen months after suffering America's worst environmental catastrophe, Prince William Sound is slowly regaining its health and beauty. But this body of water is many times bigger than Tampa Bay. Here, we would have much more to lose, for we have so little left to save. Tampa Bay has lost uh, uh, much of the seagrass that they had. In fact, it's in the area of 80% of the seagrasses have been lost. Uh, the mangroves, which are our valuable habitat uh, for our fishery systems as well as our uh, wildlife and birds, uh, we've lost about 60-65% of that. Tony Lozon is a Bay Area environmentalist dedicated to restoring the Bay. On this day, he was aboard the Suncoast Seabird Sanctuary's research vessel, Whisker, along with Sanctuary Director Ralph Heath and Dr. Bernie Ross of USF, one of the foremost experts on currents of the Bay. Joining them, a man who is no stranger to those currents, Tampa Bay pilot John Timmel. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. John. Hello. Welcome aboard, sir. The group has gathered not only to learn from one another, but to simply get to know each other. One of the greatest contributors to the confusion and inefficiency in Alaska's response to the Exxon Valdez spill was that many of the people who had to deal with the disaster had never met, much less worked together. Prince William Sound was overrun by oil, not because the people didn't know their enemy, as much as they didn't know their allies. That's another mistake this group hopes not to make. An accident occurs, then you have to dispatch that equipment down to wherever the oil might make landfall. Depending on the wind, it would carry it about... Uh... But to head off a spill that's being carried away by the swift currents of the bay, you'd have to know in exactly what direction it is going. To that end, you'd have to post a sentry to constantly monitor the currents. Well, that's just what's been done. A few weeks ago, a highly sensitive current monitoring device was installed on the bottom of the bay by the Skyway to instantly relay current speed and direction to shore stations. This can enable us to head the enemy off at the pass, so to speak, assuming we have the manpower and equipment to deploy in its path. If you had the volunteers who were, were ready, and uh, in six hours you could get out there and do something with it, I think. But right now we don't have uh, such a system in place, do we? We don't even have the interest or, the, or even the uh, concept in place. Prince William Sound is rich in resources. But ironically, when it came time to save them, the officials in charge failed to avail themselves of one of them, a great human resource, the fishermen. They and their boats are abundant. No one knows the waters better and they're well-equipped and highly skilled in deploying and trolling huge nets, the very skills necessary in the use of containment equipment. There's a story that they tell in Cordova where the people from Exxon didn't return our phone calls for the first week, and yet we had hundreds, literally hundreds of fishing boats that were ready to go to sea to help contain this oil. And when they finally did, they picked up more oil than any, anything else out there, even the Navy skimmers. The Bay Area has an equal complement of skilled commercial fishermen and many times the number of recreational boaters, who also played a vital part in the Alaskan spill. The recreational boaters, of course, also played a part in the cleanup. As, as after all, like towing a boom, a boat's a boat. It just needs power to pull it. And so there are a number of... Uh, charter boat fishermen and, and even recreational fishermen that are also in, involved. In the Bay Area then, we have a remarkable resource in our commercial and recreational boaters that is going untapped, despite the fact they already have a proven track record. Back aboard the research vessel Whisker, Dr. Ross recalls that record with pride. The boaters in this area are public-minded, every one of them. Twice now I've called on volunteers to take water quality measurements in the Bay. You really ought to have train volunteers right here in this area and I would think that there would be hundreds of boaters who would sign up to take that training. Our fishermen are going to be like a volunteer fire department. There's going to be drills year in and year out and uh, when there's an alarm we can put 70 boats on the water. If 
there's a Jack Powell is a ranking member of the Florida League of Anglers and a veteran of the Bay Area's last major spill in 1970. It was devastating. For months, we were, there were, the wildlife just died off. The Regrettably, his efforts to have boaters and fishermen involved in the current plans for spill containment have fallen on deaf ears. It's just, it's been dead end so far. I've just evidently have not knocked on the right doors. Uh, it's not an issue that's been taken really into heart around here because we haven't had anything bad. Unfortunately, it's going to take something bad to really open up the doors. 